<laughs> Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and today is our first day of municipal year on the Cross Border Interviews, where we're going to be sitting down for the rest of the year with municipal councillors, local government officials to talk about local issues. And today, to start off this whole year, I could not have been honored enough to have our guest into the show. She is a current councillor for the city of Yorkton, but she is here on her other job as president of the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Associations, or SUMA for short, President Randy Golden. President, Councillor, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and, and thank you for honoring uh, myself and Suma with this interview. Nothing better uh, to start early in the new year talking about municipal government and the people who uh, we do all the services and everything for. That's why we're here. So before we talk about your role in Suma and what Suma is, I want to ask the question I've asked every single politician on my show. So you're no exception. So, Councillor, where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, you know, growing up in Saskatchewan, um, and I grew up in a very small community. Uh, my parents were farmers. We lived in a very small village. Um, and uh, my dad's farm was a mile out. And quite frankly, uh, if you wanted anything done, you volunteered and you got it together and you found like-minded people and you got things done. And uh, as I grew up, I had great, uh, you know, role models. And I'm hoping that uh, that I've continued to be a role model for my family and my friends and my neighbors. And that's where the duty comes from, because it's all about people and it's all about really enjoying what we have in our communities and and many of them are small, Chris, much like in Alberta. You, we've all got the bigger places that we like to go and visit, um, like your city of Calgary. Um, my husband and I uh, made that journey when we first married, and we were uh, living in Calgary. Um, two of our four children were born in Calgary. And then, you know, we had that calling to come back to Saskatchewan, as many do. So that's where we've been, and that's where we raised our family, and that's where we've uh, really enjoyed living. Well, when I first moved out to Ontario, from Ontario to the uh, Western Canada, Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, the border city, I, I resided on the Saskatchewan side for a reason, because it is such a down-home province, and I had the pleasure to report on some of the issues that were going on in Saskatchewan at that time. So I haven't had that calling yet to come back to Saskatchewan, but it might be in the near future after this conversation. Um, I want to talk, though, about local government, because you talk about volunteerism, but you decided that the best way to serve your community and your province was local government, municipal politics. What was it about local government that drew you to it? You know, um, after uh, my husband and I moved back to Yorkton um, and, and continued with our family, we became very involved in the community. Our daughters were figure skaters. Our sons were hockey players. They played ball. They went to golf lessons. You know, so we got very, very, um, you know, involved. Ukrainian dance lessons, all those kind of things. Um, and the more involved I got, and uh, for instance, with figure skating, you know, I became the president of figure skating. And here's something I know you will you will relate to, as many people that are uh, that are with us today will also. I. I honestly thought that the hockey players were getting better ice time and they were getting more ice time, um, you know, so I got more involved with um, our Parks and Recreation Commission and ended up chairing it. And very quickly, I found out that, you know, our community is more than about ice time. It's about um, you know, it's about our cemetery. We have a cemetery. When I first got on to chairing that committee, I'm going, we spend more money on the cemetery than we do in programming, but then found out that that's a service that is vital to our community. So I became more involved that way and, and really, really grew, uh, you know, with, with the community uh, and very, and grew with what I did. So that's basically how, how I became involved. Well, I, I'm glad you said that because you, you, while you're involved 
at your city level, the city of Yorkton, you are also the president of the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association, or SUMA for short. So before we get into the issues that are facing SUMA and municipalities across Saskatchewan, can you tell my listeners and my viewers, what is SUMA? Well, Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association. So SUMA represents the urban municipalities um, in Saskatchewan. So in Saskatchewan, we're a bit of an anomaly. We have 742 incorporated municipalities. What? 742? Yes. <laughs> okay. We're all about that in Saskatchewan. <laughs> so uh, 742. Um, there are 446 urban municipalities um, and 296 rural municipalities. So urbans are the municipalities that are the hubs we provide the services. So, um, you know, we provide the recreation, we provide the water, we provide the policing, all those kinds of servicing, you know, the, the um, you know, the landfills, those things that is done by mostly by the urban municipalities. We have few rural municipalities that may also supply some of them, the very large ones. So that's what we do in the urban municipalities. Now, our 441 members are all over the province. We're in the north, we're in the south, we're in the east, and we're in the west. Some of, you know, uh, the mayor of Torquay, who you inter you interviewed, Mike Strachan, is 12 kilometers away from the American border. Um, and then we go all the way up to our new northern municipalities. So those urbans and who we represent are all over the all over the province. And you know, they may be small, 50 people to our larger cities. Uh, giant in Saskatoon. But I like to say and like to think no matter how large you are, we have the same issues. It's just our budgets that may be a little different. There may be just a little more zeros in the budgets of Regina and Saskatoon than there are in Yorkton or Ebenezer or, or Torquay. So how do you represent such a diverse organization like that because i can imagine the issues that are facing regina and saskatoon are not the issues that are facing yorkton or uh swift current so the balance that you have to do as suma to represent all 441 is probably a fine balancing act well you know it's it's interesting chris that you mentioned that because that's probably uh, no different that when I'm, um, you know, uh, I'm representing the people that live in my community of Yorkton, close to 20,000. And when I go shopping or when I go to watch my children, grandchildren, and now I have a great grandson in Yorkton uh, in their sports or in their cultural activities, different people have different needs. And that's what we see in, in our municipalities. But it's interesting um, as SUMA goes about its work, and we have three main core things we do. We do advocacy. We do, um, you know, we do uh, group programs so that people can buy in and hopefully get the best prices for what they uh, what they need to serve their residents. And we do capacity building. So that's training and tools, you know, uh, webinars, our convention. So those three things and, and our advocacy is around mental health and addiction. That's one of our cornerstones right now. And that's coming out of the pandemic. Those issues were there before, but they've really been exasperated right now. We also are talking about municipal election dates. Um, in our province two years ago, um, our province moved uh, the election dates. We were always towards the end of October. Now we're in mid-November and the last municipal election in 2020 was a total disaster. We had some communities because of a storm that came through had like 19 percent voter turnout um you know our our residents were confused with which election is which uh, we had issues um you know with our with our populations issues getting election workers so that's one of our big things so it doesn't matter if you're in a in a smaller community and a larger that's an issue um, you know we also are taking a look at at health care that's another one of our advocacy roles um, and we're seeing the same no matter how large you are, um, you know, ambulances and, um, you know, recruiting doctors, 
Um, and then uh, one of the things that is really affecting our province, and I know it goes across Canada, anyone that's represented by RCMP policing, the retro pay that, uh, that we have uh, been hit with, even though we did not take part in the negotiations, you know, so there's those things that, that affect all our communities. And then the big one, infrastructure. We have huge deficits in our infrastructure. You know, everything uh, that you see above ground, you know, the, the facilities, the buildings, the roads, uh, but then also I know here in York, and it's it's huge with we're just been seeing a lot of water main breaks so it's all the underground the uh the water the sewer uh wastewater all those kind of things so even though we have different sizes and different populations some of the things that i i just went over those six seven things we know that we can represent a good majority of our um members uh, by having good advocacy and sometimes Chris, that advocacy might be a little different. And that happened around, you know, when would it be best to have a municipal election? Our towns and villages would love September. Our cities would like to change the whole cycle and go in the spring. So that's what we're advocating for because we pay all the costs for the municipal elections, but the but provincial government tells us when to host it and when to have it. So how does that advocacy work in Saskatchewan? Because you have a provincial government that resides in Regina and you're advocating for changes, but it sounds like you have larger centers that are saying we want spring, some saying we want September. Yep. How do you advocate when you have two different views? Do you say, we kind of want both. Can you give us both? It'd be greatly appreciated. And the government saying, no, you have to do it the way we want to. How do you re uh, remove the logger jam that the provincial government set up there that's saying, no, it's in November. You have to do it in November. Well, you know, Chris, um, you sound like one of our provincial politicians right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the questions that people want to know, I guess. <laughs> So those are the questions that I had to answer. And quite frankly, right now in the process we have, we have rural municipalities that uh, that have, hold their elections right now, mid-November, but they they do it every two years instead of every four years because they they take they uh, they uh, the, you know they take odd odd numbers of districts go one, one two year process and the next is the even. Our small resort villages have their elections in the summertime when people who have cabins and reside at the lake are there. And then we have our Northern municipalities that have a choice between three dates. So to say we have to have a consistent date, well, right now we have, you know, three dates that are going and, you know, it seems to be working. You, you you talk about the differences that, that uh, municipalities across the urban municipalities are uh, facing across Saskatchewan. And I want to talk about one that came up two times during my interviews with two councillors from uh, two elected officials from uh, Saskatchewan, one from Martinsville and one from Torquay. And it was about infrastructure. Aging infrastructure is one of these big issues that small municipalities larger urban municipalities are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But at the end of the day, you and I both know that the taxpayer has to pay for it. They're one person. You can't squeeze more money out of a uh, stone after you've already squeezed it dry. How do you fix projects, infrastructure projects like infrastructure on a, on a provincial wide scale when you know your tax base is still the same tax base that's going to be there tomorrow, going to be there the week after, and they're already hurting as it is because of rising costs. Well, very interesting. And these are many discussions that we've had around the SUMA table, around every council table in the province and with our provincial and our federal partners, because we know. So that are the, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but are the feds at the table in your discussions? Because I'm assuming SUMA is just a provincial, like you're just only talking to the province of Saskatchewan. But you're saying right here, right now, you're talking to the federal government as well. Yes, we are, because we are members of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And I've actually been a board member there for about 12 years. So always having those discussions and every president of a provincial organization 
is also included. They are they have a role to play with FCM. They are a board member uh, from uh, Alberta, the uh, rural Alberta municipalities. Uh, the Alberta municipalities, Kathy Heron sits on the president. Paul McLaughlin sits on it. I sit on it. Our rural sits on it. So there is that partnership and advocacy that is happening. And what we're seeing is the tax dollar that is collected from our municipalities. Of every dollar, the municipalities only receive eight cents. But that's where all the action happens. We know that, you know, what we've just been speaking about happens in our communities. If there's going to be economic development done to try to, um, you know, increase the pies, then it's happening in our municipalities. So what Suma and our my my other presidents, the other presidents across the country are saying is, we need to be at these tables when discussions and deliberations are happening. Many times we're contacted after. So what do you think? After the legislation has gone in, after the, the funding programs are put in place, that's too late. So we need a seat at the table. Um, you know, at times you hear from some of our federal representatives, well, you know, municipalities are creatures of the province. So speak with them. But if you take a look at many of the infrastructure projects that we see, they, they are a partnership with the federal government and the provincial government. And right now, seven of those uh, funding programs, the big funding programs out of the feds, are going to soon be expiring, 2026, 2028. Many of them are already fully allocated. And now we need to take a look at what is the criteria to move forward? You know, how can we get better um, involvement from the municipalities? Uh, for instance, in Yorkton, here's a here's a really good example. We operate a regional uh, airport and the, the city of Yorkton, it's all our cost. Because we don't have scheduled air service here, um, we can't get federal funding. And we won't ever have scheduled air service in Yorkton. You see what's happening with the airlines in the big cities, Calgary, Edmonton. Saskatoon Regina. But we we have a huge role to play in that transportation, um, you know, the getting our products to market, getting people to medical appointments, bringing business people in. Those library, those airports are key, and yet we can't get federal funding. So we've been advocating that in that transportation envelope, we need to see regional airports get some type of funding. So as we continue to advocate, we need to take a look at what municipalities need and how do we better divide up that $1 pie so that the eight cents, first of all, can be spread out a little wider so that it's not just all the municipalities that are having to come up with this. Because I mean, you chatted with uh, the mayor of Martinsville. That's one of the newer communities in our, in our province and they have infrastructure problems. Yorkton has 100-year-old pipes underground. Anything 100 years old is going to start having issues. You you bring up a good point, and I want to sort of pose this question to you, and I did not prepare this question, so it might come off a little convoluted, so I do apologize. Okay. Municipalities are the front line of politics. They are the ones that people deal with on a regular basis. But municipalities from across Canada, particularly in the Western, in Western Canada, and I would say even all across Canada, they have to deal with issues that are not just municipal issues. Yeah. They have to deal with provincial issues. You talk about healthcare. They have to deal with mental health. They have to deal with federal issues. You talk about transportation. Mm -hmm. And you're only getting eight cents on the dollar. Is this a fair deal that municipalities are receiving when it comes to our current relationship with provincial and federal counterparts? In my opinion, we do not. I think we pay a very, very uh, important role in, in all that we do, all that we provide. Um, and I understand there's pressures on the provinces, there's pressure on the federal government, but I think that is why FCM and our provinces are saying, we need a better seat at the table. Um, and here's an example, uh, the RCMP retro pay back in 2015, 2016, we, you know, we knew, we were told the federal government is uh, now negotiating um, and we're not, 
the the question isn't on RCMP policing at all because they're very valued in our communities. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is we were never involved. We were told it was happening. We were told that we should put something in reserve. My community, Yorkton, we did. You know, we did start a reserve, but we never thought it would be 23% increase. And, you know, the invoices were to come out in May for 23%. In, in my community, that was $1.6 million alongside now the annual yearly increases. So, um, you know, our municipalities uh, throughout the uh, country with their provincial associations like SUMA, um, we started a great deal of advocacy along with FCM because the invoices were coming out in May. They were to be paid by July of 2022. And we had to do some awareness and education. Our community didn't have $1.6 million sitting there and we can't deficit budget. Yeah. That's a legislated um, you know, issue. We cannot deficit, so we need time. So we've been advocating and, and meeting with uh, Minister Mendocino. Now we've been told um, before Christmas that soon we would know what was going to happen. They did put a pause on the invoicing, but we're asking that the federal government pick up this cost, the whole cost of the retro pay, because we weren't at the table. Just the so, retro pay, right? You're just, just asking the them because going for it, you'll be able to budget correctly, but you didn't know what the budget, the the bill was going to be in May of last year. That is correct. Uh, you know, and I think, Chris, quite frankly, this is about fairness. As you said, we have all the issues that are happening. Uh, we take all the downloads, whether it's provincial or federal, you know, and, and totally understand it. So when something changes in water quality, and we now have um, some some uh, new, new restrictions, we have to uh, make sure the water is safe, landfills, all those things. We know we have to do that because we want to have a safe, you know, sustainable communities, but we need help in that. When something like that comes down, We'd like to see an offer of some assistance, especially perhaps if there's a transition that has to happen, um, you know, or, you know, if there's a, there's a timeline that it has to happen. Let's sit down and talk about that. Do you see any movement from the federal or provincial governments of some type of olive branch that they're trying to extend to you or because I, I'm not trying to beat up on the provincial oh. government or federal oh. government in this interview. I just want to know from your standpoint as president of SUMA, because you're the one who's dealing with the minister of municipal affairs, you're the one who's advocating at FCM. Are you seeing a little bit of movement. Give me a silver lining in this story, Randy, because I want one. <laughs> I know. Well, it was so interesting because this morning um, I uh, listened uh, to um, one of our radio stations in the province interviewing our premier, Premier Scott Moe, who I've met with, I've had conversations with. Um, and he was talking about a new program that was released in the throne speech about by 2026, Saskatchewan was going to have uh, a marshal system for policing. And um, I heard him say, you know, we're going, you know, we've been collaborating on this. And I'm going, well, I wonder with who. Um, and in all fairness, perhaps, you know, it, we should take, you know, SUMA. So after I got off this, I, I sent a text to our CEO and saying, um, I think perhaps we should ask the premier, you know, is he waiting for us to ask to collaborate or what's the process? Because our concern is sooner or later, who, who's paying for these 700 new marshals in our province? Where are they coming from? How are they being trained? You know, those kind of questions, because, you know, sooner or later, it seems municipalities are picking up the cost. So whether it's mental health and addictions, you know, we're, we're doing some work with, uh, with some of the uh, ministers around that, because we have a minister of health, a minister of a rural health and addictions, you know, depending on where you are in the province. So we've been having these, you know, these conversations around housing. So we're seeing some movement on this, but there's so many things that affect, um, you know, our homes and our way of life and our municipalities and our cities, towns, villages, resort villages, that there's so many things we can be talking with, with provincial government. Um, and we will continue to do that. Um, 
since I became president and even before the president before me, we've been very active meeting with the ministers, the premier, um, our, our uh, you know, our SUMA staff is meeting with officials uh, to have those discussions. Um, you know, let us help you. What can we do? We can engage with our members so we can go directly to our members and say, what do you think of the marshal service in, in our province? You know, do you think that's needed? You know, if, if it is, how best do we help with, with protective services in our province? So is there some movement? Probably. Is there enough? Probably not. <laughs> it sounds like, and I don't want to put words in your mouth here, uh, President uh, Golden, but it sounds like you're saying that the provincial government and federal government are a shoot first, ask questions later mentality of, we'll say something and it's going to work out, but... We'll, we'll figure out the details later when it comes to what the municipalities have to pick up. Am I hearing you correctly on that or am I just many out to lunch? Times that, many times that is correct. And I'm certain that, you know, they have so many priorities on, on, on uh, what they do too. We're pleased though, that because of the work of FCM um, and our, our, pro, our, you know, provincial associations, those uh, invoices for the retroactive pay for our CMP have been paused and now they're taking a good look. We've had many, many discussions with the ministers and officials on how how do we deal with that. So you know they've they've done that. These um, the uh, changes that we would like to see with infrastructure uh, funding coming out of the feds who partner with the provinces. We've been consulted on that. Uh, from our province, we have a really good model here on revenue sharing. It's uh, by per capita that we get. Uh, uh, points. 0.75% of the PST collected um, goes into our revenue sharing, and then it's allocated by uh, per capita. And, you know, our SUMA is suggesting that maybe we take a look at doing our federal grants that way. Might You might not get the giant grants for one project, but you would be able to get sustainable funding that you could plan for. And if you need a water treatment plant, or if you need to put in new, uh, new roads or new sewers or sidewalks, you can plan for that in a sustainable way. It's not, you know, we have to make an application. It has to be shovel ready, has to have engineering involved. Then you don't get the grant. And then what? I, I'm going to put you on the spot here for a second, because you, you mentioned something that the mayor of Torquay mentioned in our, his interview with myself yeah. about uh, water treatments and his community having to work in partnership with other outside municipalities um and i'm gonna ask the stupid question because i i think it needs to be asked because you mentioned a big giant number at the beginning of this interview that saskatchewan has over 740 incorporated towns urban municipalities communities within its borders mm -hmm. Do municipalities in Saskatchewan need to start working together or even looking at the A word, which we shall not mention what it is, but is the amalgamation word even on the radar with the municipalities? Because it seems like with the issues that are going on, it would be easier to partner or get together with other municipalities and say, okay, let's work for the common good of our area and try to fix and try to fix water treatment plants, roads, pipelines that way, instead of working individually against each other? Well, you know, that's so interesting. But currently, there there is no interest, no appetite from our provincial government. So um, what SUMA is doing is we're encouraging our municipalities to work together, regional cooperation. Um, Thursday night, I will be going out to um, just... Uh, uh, east of here in the area around Churchbridge, Langenberg, Esterhazy, and there are the urbans and the rurals that have been getting together for years, and they talk about regional participation uh, and how can they make things better. And one of the things that they work together on is bylaw enforcement that is so needed in our communities. And so, you know, you, but that just seems to be off the desk of another staff person and it's just not done properly. So they've gotten together and, and um, you know, uh, share a, a community safety officer or a bylaw person. And, you know, they do that, they, they do some of those things. They also talk about any other things that they can share equipment. Um, from, from Yorkton, 
Um, you know, we share some of our equipment with the smaller communities around us, um, you know, like the cameras that go into the pipes so that you can see what's clogging things up. Well, our small communities can't afford to have those. So, you know, Yorkton has one. Um, so we, we work with our surrounding communities. You see that around fire protection um, because many of our urbans uh, will have volunteers. Some of those volunteers may come from the rural areas. So you're seeing some of that natural cooperation that happens, but should there be more? Probably there should be more. How do you make that happen? <laughs> when every community takes such great pride in their community. You know, and we see that. I go and I visit many, many different communities and I learn about their cultural groups and, and their sporting groups and the pride that they take. The senior facilities that everyone seems to have, the libraries. So do I think we can do more regional cooperation? Absolutely. And I believe that that could also um, improve, you know, the lives of all the people that live in our communities. And I think we should be doing that um, in respect to our own communities um, and, you know, not waiting for provincial government. Um, I'm a huge believer in, you know, let's take responsibility. Let's take the responsibility and let's make things happen in, in our communities. I, I want to uh, ask one last question before we move into the next segment of this conversation. And that is the future of this year. Um, you talked about some very important issues that are facing municipalities right now. You talked about mental health. You talked about ambulance, RCMP, infrastructure. What will you hope at the end of this year, at the end of 2023, what do you hope as president of SUMA that you as the organization will be able to move forward or even accomplish this year to say, okay, if we can get one thing done, I hope it's X. What is X for SUMA for 2023 on the municipal file? Well, that's a really good question. What is X? Well, I really believe that uh, as we go through our work, it's all about our people that live in our communities. Um, and whether you represent somebody uh, that has a community like Yorkton or Torquay or Ebenezer or a Northern municipality of Pine House, I would hope that somewhere along the line, when we finish the work this year, that our residents are feeling safer and healthier. And, you know, whether that's uh, with the improved health care, whether if they can, they require ambulance care, that it can get there in a timely fashion. Um, you know, if policing is necessary, that, that there's good response time, that we don't have boil water, you know, um, in our Northern communities. So I, I just want to think when we go through all our grocery list here, our menu of what we're doing, that when I talk with people in, in our communities at the, at the convention or at our regional meetings or our sector meetings, I can have and I can hear them say, thank you, because this has helped us do our work in our communities. Um, you know, will, will we end mental health and addictions? in one year, I think that's a big ask. Yeah. But can we get down that road? Um, can we get down that road and make things a little better for people so that if they're suffering and they understand they're suffering and they ask for help, they can get that help. You know, whether it's to the healthcare system or whether it's a, um, you know, a, a community-based organization. We have a beautiful one here in Yorkton called Sign that provides those kind of services. That help is there for our people. I have children and grandchildren and now great grandson here. And I want them to stay in Saskatchewan or come back if they're getting their education. And, and you know, when they go through the checklist of what they're looking for, that's I, I want them to know that Saskatchewan should be at the top of the list. Ooh, I want to turn to uh, the strategic plan. In 2021, Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association released the 2021-2025 strategic plan for the organization. Well, we're halfway through, and I always like to do a little checkup, see how that strategic plan, I've read through it. In your opinion, have you been hitting the milestones? Have you been hitting the things you need to be doing to move the organization of SUMA forward? And how do you see 2023 shaping out in regards to that strategic plan? 
We've been working uh, very, very um, strongly on many of them. Uh, the one that uh, I, I think has been on our plate ever since I got on the board was to take a look at our governance. How are we governing? How do members get their voices to the board so that when choices have to be made, um, you know, that we hear voices from all our sectors uh, across the, uh, the province? And that we have taken a huge stride in. Uh, we've worked very hard in that. We've gone across the province now to all our members with some um, some things that we've been hearing around the board structure, election of the president, all those kind of things that come into structure. And we're hearing very positive um, feedback from our members on what we presented. So I think we're making a check mark on that. Um, one of the things uh, that we've also in our strategic plan, uh, you will see, is to really to build our relationship with Indigenous, um, with our Indigenous communities, our um, organizations across the province. And we've been working very hard on that. Um, that is not something, Chris, that you can say, well, yeah, we're working on it this year. It'll all be done. Yeah. So it's an ongoing you know, partnership, right? It's always something that's always going to have to evolve, just like your relationship with the federal and provincial government. Exactly. Personalities change, so you have to change with them sometimes. You know, so we're we're working really hard on that one. Um, you know, and it's not just about the president getting out to the communities, although that's a good thing. I, I spent uh, um, a week uh, visiting communities in northern uh, Saskatchewan um, on the uh, eastern side of northern of northern Saskatchewan. And next summer, I'm going to try to get to. The western portion along with our our directors that we have for that so and really hearing from the communities so it's it's really interesting one of the things and and you mentioned it you lived in the border community that's not the only border community that we have we have flin flon and creighton and the beach and that's the border right. goes right through it like it does lloyd minster i was actually i was on the street that cuts through so there's uh, so you know, Flint Flon actually is in both sides. I knew I knew the yes. community was. I didn't know the town was as well. Yes. yes. So there's uh, so they have residents on both sides. So having some really good discussions because Lloyd Minster has a charter, working with both provinces, and it's interesting when we chatted with them there, they have some of the same issues. So you know, and 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 it's great they come to our convention as the mayor of Lloyd Minster goes to both Alberta and Saskatchewan. So we're really looking forward to developing that even a little further. And uh, you know, so those are something that was a really good thing that came out of that northern tour. But one of the things I I really saw and recognized because I've heard this, you see it, you read it. Uh, we drove up through Prince Albert. We were close to uh, Candle Lake, just past the Candle Lake exit. Um, and what happened? No cell coverage. No cell coverage till we got to Denaire Beach. That's like four hours. If something happens, uh, what do you do? Yep. I actually halfway there, I there's a place to stop. I saw a telephone booth, like with a telephone in it that worked like a pay phone, Chris. Like how often do you see those? But that's the only communication. And that was halfway up. That's unacceptable in a province like Saskatchewan. That's unacceptable. So, you know, we've been working on working on that also is the whole, um, you know, the whole issue with with Internet service and broadband uh, and that goes uh, with our provincial and federal partners. And we really have been doing a great deal of work. And you've read in a strategic plan about regional development economic development, about cooperation. So we've been doing many different things with all our toolbox of things, whether it's webinars or meetings, we've been working on that. So I think we've got a, a good check mark there. Um, and something when we talk about safety and policing um, that came to us um, about a year ago, and we've gotten good, um, I guess, understanding from our uh, provincial government, we're doing a renewal of the Police Act. Nothing has been touched uh, since the 90s. And you can understand the changes and the languages that we have to use. So, um, yeah, so we're we're doing some of that work and, um, you know, always updating the strap plan. And if we we don't really check these things right off, because we know as we do one thing, more things fall out. 
I, I want to, I'm going to put you on the spot here for a second here because again, you ha- again, yes, Chris? yes. That's yeah. my job as host to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association, SUMA, has a convention coming up in April. Um, what it, what can we expect? Are you excited to get back in person and meet with your fellow colleagues from across the province and talk to them one-on-one in person again? Oh, my gosh. So last year was our first real in-person Um, And it was busy and it was so good to see people again, but there was always that little bit of a tentative, right? Um, And uh, understand I was going through an election campaign to become president at that time too. So, uh, and I really thank uh, Mayor uh, Kyle Bennett from Shonovan for putting his name forward because that's what we're all about. We live in a democracy. And so um, I got to speak to many of our, um, of our members uh, through the election campaign, but I am so looking forward to being much more relaxed at this convention and, and talking with our, with our members one-on-one. I've been across the province now um, several times um, and I want to get back um, and really sit down and have those conversations, but also to hold our provincial leaders who will be at our convention. And I'm talking about the, the government in power, our opposition, uh, because in in my belief, our government is as strong as our opposition is. Yeah. We need to have those good discussions happen and we need to be a part of that. So I'm really looking forward to that because um, last year, our members really, um, really um, conveyed their thoughts on many of those key advocacy pieces that we talked about to our elected uh, provincial officials. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm looking forward to some of the social times we'll have again, because I love doing that. And we all love doing that. So we've got some of that built in as we go through tours around Saskatoon. Um, And believe it or not, I'm looking forward to the tour of the Saskatoon landfill. I mean, that's one of the the examples in our whole province. And I mean, you know, you're a municipal leader when you want to go to a landfill, Chris. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, to all the speakers that we're bringing in. Um, you know, and uh, uh, just learning and taking things home because I've been on council for over 20 years and have attended all those conferences in that time. And I always came home with something valuable that I could use uh, in what I did municipally, but even in some of the things that you can put to use in your personal life. Well, while the details are still being worked out, uh, we're we're planning, knock on wood, to have the show at the SUMA convention for two days to do some live shows at, in SUMA to talk to some of the municipal leaders from across Saskatchewan. So I'm looking forward, if everything works out and John, Mark, and I can get all the details worked out, yes. to meeting you in person and actually sitting down and having a coffee with you in person. Oh my gosh. And you know what, Chris, I would love to do the tour of the landfill with you. Let's do it. We're going to go to the hangar where the stars helicopters are, you know, like how exciting is that? You know, so I'm all about municipal government. So if John, Mark and I can work out a deal where I can get, get some time where I can spend two hours a day for some live shows and have some people on, let's do it. And I can just line up so many interviews with so many great municipal leaders. I can't wait. That's another uh, reason I can't wait till April. That's right. Um, Randy, President, Councillor, thank you so much. This has been an honor to start off this new, the new sort of the new branding of the cross border interviews municipally. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better guest and you have made the last 45 minutes just fly by. So thank you so much. Chris, and thank you for really being interested in what we do in each one of our hometowns um, across the whole country. Thank you for that. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody and talk to them. It helps our society. It helps our democracy and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this being the cross-border interviews, have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone, Keep talking. Keep talking.